Lord, as we unpack your word this morning, as we look at your life, Father, I pray for each of us that we will walk out of here emboldened, emblazoned in your spirit. Seen something, Lord, that maybe we just skip over far too often. Pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to say good morning again, but seeing I've so far led the morning. Hi. Anybody had a nice cup of coffee and tea so far? Good. I'll be drinking mine through this talk. Well, um, I, I was unpacking and I thought, well, what do we need to do uh, uh, this week? And then I found myself this word back to basics, or three words, depends on how you want to look at it. Yeah, it does a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, I hadn't realised that until that moment. Thanks for that, Anne. I was thinking it was of God. Um, oh, it could well be of God, even if it's a politician. Um, but back to basics. Well, we're good evangelicals in this church. If you're part of this church, our main sort of stance on life is evangelical, which basically means, in short term of it, we enjoy the Psalms, we look at the Gospel of John, and we love all the pastoral letters. All the 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. We love all of them. But we seem to avoid the rest of the Old Testament. And we seem to avoid the other three Gospels. That's generally the, the modern day version today. And most certainly the one Gospel that gets avoided a lot because people just... It's only taken the last century for us to realise it's a really good Gospel. And that's the Gospel of Mark. So we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John. No, I'm joking. Mark. <laughs> and um, so we're going to do that. Now, I'll be up front. I'm not sure if I'm going to go through the entire book as a series with you, or we're going to be looking at bits and bobs as we go along. I haven't quite fully sorted that with, um, with the Lord yet. Or should I say my ears have probably been open enough. But I just felt this was right for this morning, definitely. So you're up for that. And the reason I'm calling it Back to Basics is because it's so good to look at ecclesiology, it's look at the church and the way church should run and how we should love each other and, and all that stuff. But actually, I think sometimes we need to look at our Jesus, look at how he walked the earth, what he did while he was in the flesh, yes? Because we are meant to model exactly what he did. Granted, we don't wear sandals anymore. Well... Not unless it's summer and I'm on the beach. But beyond that, we are meant to model what our Lord Jesus uh, did. So we're going to do that. So we're going to start right from the beginning of Mark 1. But a bit of background history first. Are you ready? Probably written around about AD 68 to the Roman Gentile Christians. So these are the Christians that are living in Rome who actually don't come from the Jewish uh, uh, well, weren't Jewish. They are the Gentiles, the ones who didn't follow the Torah. So he's writing to that. The reason we know this is because there's very little Old Testament quote in Mark. And any Jewish festivals or customs that he mentions, he explains in detail. Ergo, he's not writing to Jews. Because Jews would know all of this. They wouldn't have to worry about it. They, if he pulls from the Old Testament all the time, they go, oh, yeah, we get that. If he just went, oh, no the Festival of Unleavened Bread, they go, oh yeah, we know what you mean, but he unpacks it. So clearly these are not from, uh, 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 from the, the Israelite nation. And also at this time, there was a great persecution against the Christians by the Roman Emperor Nero. Basically, Nero needed someone to blame for a great fire that had taken place in Rome, even though according to history books, he ordered it because he wanted to clear a large swathe of Rome so he could build a fantastic palatial area. Of course, he started getting a bit of uprising and a bit of battling. His own people were starting to have a go at him. So he needed to blame someone. Who do you blame? Christians. Most despots have always found that if you need to divert the attention of everyone, find some group and blame them. He was particularly vicious in his practice. Uh, he would stick Christians on poles, set them alight, so they could sort of line the pathway uh, towards uh, palaces, etc. He also was throwing them in arenas with wild animals. 
and we worry about being laughed at in the workplace. Mark himself here is probably John Mark, as described in Acts 12, verse 12. Mark followed the apostle Peter, and was Peter's sort of scribe as such. Therefore, the book of Mark is seen as Peter's memoirs. Peter's own autobiography of walking with Jesus. You with me so far? So it wasn't that Mark, as such, was a close disciple of Jesus at that time. It was more, this is Peter's memoirs. And so therefore then, Mark wrote these down and, and kept them written record eventually, obviously, after listening to Peter. It is also considered to be the earliest gospel written of Jesus' ministry out of the four, well, the three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is a completely sort of different way of looking at Jesus, but definitely Mark appears to be the earliest because what you've got in Mark, you then have two stories that are both in Matthew and in Luke, and it would appear they may have um, purloined some from him. This book is incredibly fast-paced. Mark doesn't mess around too much. Everything has a certain of the urgent and the immediate. It's an exciting book. <laughs> really, John? Are you teaching us on the moment, are you? Have you oh! Oh, maybe I was listening to God right then. Right. Good. So, house group of Johns um, and Anne's, um, you're going to ask me all the answers then. Oh, no. <laughs> so, this is exciting. I want you, I love this book. I remember my first year at Theological College, it was one of the ones that we cracked open and started on. I went, wow. When you start getting behind it, you think, wow. So, I, I love it. It's exciting. It's fast-paced. Mark uses six distinct styles of writing to get a message across. This is not always just the words on the page. It's also how they're written. Do you remember I've said before, if you read uh, the Gospels, they've actually been written in a particular style so that there's an underlying message you pick up as you go along without them having to explain it. Um, I think in our days, these days of instant everything, I think we've lost that technique of reading in that way. You get it in movies sometimes. A movie is trying to give you an underlying message and you see that the way it's been put together. Well, he uses a sandwich technique. That does not mean you can have cheese and onion later. He has a way of, to get a theological key across, he has a way of writing a story, then inserting like an interruption, like a slab of the cheese in between. Yeah, I'm using cheese because last time I used meat as an example, and I might have upset some vegetarians. So, slab of cheese in the middle, and cheese sandwich is my favourite. Cheese sandwich, uh, a bit of cheese in there to sort of describe something that tags along the story. To give you an example um, for that, in chapter 5, uh, Jairus, the synagogue ruler, who begs Jesus to heal his daughter, as they're en route, you know the hemorrhaging woman comes along, the one who's been hemorrhaging for 12 years? Well, she comes in, interrupts Jesus. And um, that's like the, she's the piece of cheese in the story that comes along. And of course, she just touches him in faith. And then you get that happening, the healing bit, and then you get the back end of that where the story continues with them going to the synagogue. But somebody's coming interrupted and said, don't bother the teacher. Your daughter has died to the synagogue ruler. Yeah, but actually Jesus says, just have faith. And the, the bit in the middle, the cheese, the woman is showing the idea of just have faith. Do you get the point? And we'll pick that up as we go along more and more. He uses irony. Irony is the best thing, is the fact that like, the disciples and his own family take a very long time and with great difficulty to get Jesus' mission, yet a blind Bartimaeus and a Gentile centurion get it straight away. It's irony. Those closest to Jesus should be getting it, but they don't. It's like us Christians sometimes. We're the closest to Jesus. We should be getting this straight away. But probably somebody outside that goes, oh, I get it a lot quicker. It's that. There's an insider-outsider motif, which is there is this sense there are those within the inner circle of Jesus. You get that when he has to explain to them what the meaning of parables are. Yeah? 
Uh, so we'll come to that. I'm not going to explain them all deeply yet. There is a constant command to silence that Jesus uses, and you will see that. This is a book of journeying. We'll get that as we go along. And it also, and the key thing, it displays Jesus as authoritative and yet the suffering son of God. He is both the ultimate authority, but he's also showing suffering son of God. And we will just get it, unpack them as we go along. So I want you to get really excited about this book. I would highly suggest, encourage, implore, maybe with some kick, to read it all through in one hit. It take you, depending upon your reading ability and your speed, 45 minutes to an hour. That's about as long as two episodes of EastEnders. I'm just stating. That's for me, an episode of Grand Designs. Yeah? And all will go, oh, yeah, yeah, but you don't want to miss Grand Designs, do you, Warren? Well, for reading the Gospel of Mark, yes. Another quick overview, just to give you an idea. First half is split really into two distinct halves. Chapter 1, verses 1 to chapter 8, verse 26, is really about Jesus' ministry in Galilee. And the second half, the final half, is his journey to Jerusalem and what they commonly call his passion, the crucifixion on the cross. In the first half, there are 13 short, true stories describing and showing Jesus as teacher, healer, and exorcist. And he's very often in conflict with the Jewish authorities. The whole of Mark is actually, a lot of it, is all about the conflict. Jesus is forever in a battle. Be it with the Jewish authorities, be it with Satan's minions, be it with his own disciples. Remember that meek and mild Jesus? You might have a different view by the time you finish Mark. And the second half of this gospel is set off with Jesus' direct return to Jerusalem, where the journey Mark is trying to show that he is a suffering servant, and whoever desires to be his disciple must be prepared for discipleship, which involves suffering. Cheered up? Good. This, for me, shows the vision statement of Greenford Baptist Church at the moment, this gospel. Reclaiming ground and restoring hope through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the new current vision statement. Reclaiming ground and restoring hope. So we're going to get into chapter 1 now. Uh, we're probably going to go up to verse 28. And we're going to do it in sort of really, really fast. Like Mark is fast, okay? So I'm not going to unpack every little bit and every little detail. Some of you might be going, oh, thank you. But we're going to sort of chunk through it and then we're going to linger near the end on something. So I'm warning you now. Just so you get it. So, verse 1. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began when the computer decided not to work. It began... It... This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began. That's verse 1. It began. It's starting saying God, right at the beginning, knew exactly what he's doing. In the NIVs and other translations, they actually just sort of state it right at the beginning, in the beginning, where the original Greek has it. But the NLT's done it slightly differently. But I want to focus on the words good news, which means gospel. Which... This whole book, it sets off, the first verse sets off what the rest of this book is about. 
It's good news. It's the gospel. The Greek word, um, which I'm not going to pronounce this morning, is both in the Old Testament and was used in Greek language and Greek literature and was commonly used of reports of victory from the battlefield. So Mark is setting the theme agenda here that this is a good news report from the battlefield, that Jesus the Messiah has victory over the enemies, has won the war. That's a quick summary of the whole gospel in my view. Jesus has won. Jesus has won. Oh, let's do that again. Jesus has won. No, Jesus has won. And this is the good news that you're reading. It's come from the battlefield that say that Jesus has won the ultimate war. Oh, good. I said it's an exciting book. And really, there are two verses, this one and verse 2. Just as the prophet Isaiah had written, which he then continues, combining these two verses, Mark is showing that God had this all in mind, Along with the Isaiah, we have good news. Isaiah is, is the prophet that used the good news. He was talking about and prophesying that, G, uh, that God's incoming kingdom would break in. So Mark, by nicking something from the Old Testament, which I'm about to read to you, from Isaiah, is trying to display that. And this is what he wrote to verse 8. Just as the prophet Isaiah had written, Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And they, and when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Mark very briefly looks at John the Baptist. He places John the Baptist here as the Elijah prophet. The Jewish people were waiting for the return of Elijah as such, because he never actually died. He got taken away in a fiery chariot. Do you know the story? Where Elijah got taken away and Elisha got double portion because he saw him go. So I want to be Elisha. I want the double portion. From Malachi in the Old Testament, chapter 4, verses 5 to 6, the Jewish expectation was that Elijah would return as the forerunner of God's final wrap-up of history. God's overall kingdom rule would come. Mark is identifying John the Baptist as the Elijah forerunner, the description of his clothing. Camel hair, anybody wearing camel hair recently? Just got a belt around their waist, yeah? Who's eating their locusts and berries for breakfast this morning? No, I had wheat a bit, so I'm not quite sure which is better. But that is describing, that's how John was, and that's very similar to how Elijah would have been dressed. But they saw this uh, forerunner, he's saying he's the forerunner before the Messiah. But in pre-Christian Jewish texts, Elijah was not to appear before the Messiah comes, but would appear before the appearance of God himself. Let me explain. We call Jesus our Messiah. Messiah literally just means anointed one. King David was the Messiah of God. He was an anointed one of God. So they were waiting for literally the appearance of God himself, not a human um, as such being just the anointed one who's been specially gifted by God. You, you with me? 
We've got to be careful. We do call Jesus the Messiah, which is correct. But when you hear that in other contexts, the sort of King David, etc., you think, well, how does that work? It's because of their understanding now of Messiah. So Mark here, by using Isaiah and assigning John as Elijah, is saying that Jesus is God. Because they were expecting Elijah to come in and go, oh, prepare the way for the Lord, and waiting for the actual Lord to arrive. And what he's saying, well, here it is. Jesus is God. Therefore, John is the herald for God himself, not just the anointed one. You with me? Okay, just thought we'd get that for now. John is in the wilderness, which is biblically the place of repentance and God's grace. We see that a lot with the Israelites going around in the desert. They had to repent a lot, but they also found lots of God's grace. God giving them uh, food and manna and guiding them and keeping the soles of their shoes constantly without wearing. John even makes it clear here that he is baptizing only for repentance of sins. But someone who's even greater than than him, somebody who won't even a Gentile slave is not worthy enough to untie the sandals. By the way, uh, untying somebody's sandals and washing their feet was not done by Jewish slaves, it was only ever done by a Gentile slave. It was seen as such a disgusting job to do. So when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he really did humble himself in the social society. So John is saying here, I'm not even unworthy to even do that. He is so great. Even the dirt on his feet is greater than I am. You get in the the imagery. And John is saying, I'm only here to baptize you in water for the repentance of your sins. He will come and baptize you in the Holy Spirit, which is what we refer to here when we baptize people here. You're not just being baptized in a load of water. You're also being baptized in the Holy Spirit so that you can live into new life and new freshness within him. You accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're saved. You've repented and you're saved. Get baptized in the Holy Spirit when you're baptized in here, and there's a whole new lease of life. Anybody new to being baptized will get that. I'll unpack that another time. I'm not talking double baptisms, by the way, in the spirit. Let's make that very clear, shall we, before I get accused of that. That's not what I'm talking about. So it's enough of John because we're meant to be focusing on Jesus, which is what Mark wants us to do here in his gospel. So 9 to 15. One day, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and John baptized him in the Jordan River. He's not worthy to untie his sandals, but he baptizes him. Because Jesus said to fulfill all righteousness. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. Other translations, by the way, have that descending into him. And I think that's a better rendition of the Greek is into him. We believe the Holy Spirit lives in us. So why would the Holy Spirit just descend on God's son? He has to have gone in him. And by the way, the dove, please scrap the idea of a nice, cute little white bird. Okay, a dove in them terms is almost like a wild pigeon, a desert bird. Bit scraggly, bit wild, does whatever he wants to do, roams around, is a bit blowy with the wind, a bit of a whatever else. So if you get that image of the Holy Spirit will do whatever the Holy Spirit will do, rather than this cute little dove that comes and Renaissance picture, flies and lands upon the Lord Jesus' head, who's blonde, white, and blue-eyed. Give me a break. Do you get the point? So this wild bird, or wild spirit, goes into Jesus. Do you get it? Does that get you? By the way, it's the same Holy Spirit that's gone into you. Okay? Good. Good. I told you the book was exciting when you got underneath it. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. The spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals and angels took care of him. 
Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached good news. The, so, excuse me. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Said, Mark is all about Jesus. He doesn't go on about Jesus or John's birth or the angels or Mary or Joseph or any of that that the other Gospels have got. It's about Jesus' ministry for Mark here. He wants to just get on with it. So he has a brief look at our John the Baptist. He then jumps straight into Jesus' baptism. He takes a quick look at his time in the desert without going into any long detail at all. It's Jesus' baptism that is the most significant moment that he's interested in here. That's what he spends the most time on. Jesus' baptism was the start and the empowering of his ministry. Do you understand that? It wasn't when he was born, as significant as that was, and there's only about seven weeks to go in there. So we're back to celebrating that again by going out and shopping and buying presents that we really have no idea if they're going to like or not. Jesus' birth was key, but for the ministry time, it was his baptism. There is no recording of Jesus performing any miracle whatsoever until he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Spirit. We'll come to that in a moment. For John, there are three things that he needs to point out about Jesus that's really important at this baptism. Firstly, it's to point out, by the way, he is what's been, it's been expected since Old Testament times. Firstly, the heavens open. This is imagery that's used in the Old Testament as well about, used to describe when God acts, when the day of the Lord comes, the heavens will open. There's a there's whole imagery, I think, of almost like the stars and the thing rolling up like a scroll and disappearing. This is this imagery that's going on. Heaven has opened. It means the rending of the heavens. The Holy Spirit entering into him. And the heavenly voice speaking. All three of these things state very clearly, this is it, folks. He's come. God has arrived. The kingdom of God has arrived. Boom. If you as a Jew read that, you'll go, got it. If you was a Gentile, I'm not quite sure if he would have fully got it. But we should be getting that now. The significant writing. And I know we know it, but it's back to basics. There's a brief telling of the temptation time. The wild animals, by the way, that was used here, where he says he was out among the wild animals. That was to help the suffering Roman Christians actually notice that, they, that Jesus has identified with them when they're getting chucked into the arena with wild animals, saying, listen, Jesus was among wild animals and was tempted by Satan and all of that. It's that sort of, he's trying to just help part of that with them plus with the angels tending shows that Jesus is authoritative suffering servant he has suffered and he's authoritative because the angels have come and tended to him and 14 to 15 when John has been arrested Jesus goes into Galilee it's almost that Mark says right that's it you've had your bit on John John's now being taken out of the equation it also goes to show, again, suffering discipleship because John's done exactly what God wanted him to do, preparing the way for the Lord. He's done exactly as he was ordered, yet now he's been arrested and we know later on he is killed. It's showing again that following God's plan, following Jesus, proves it comes with suffering. As Edwards puts it, the gospel is proclaimed and known in adversity and suffering, not in ease and comfort. Mark will cheerfully show us all of that as we go through the gospel. So he wants to jump straight into Jesus' ministry time. Ready? 16 to 20. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon. 
which eventually will be called Peter. So obviously Peter wants to go, hey, put my name in there eventually, will you? Just, just Mark, if you just describe that in. And his brother Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Hey, I didn't know this. Sorry, just a quick diverse. Did you know, I don't know when you get the imagery of them fishing. I clearly don't get the imagery of poles and all of that. I don't understand fishing. That just, sorry, I don't understand why we do that. It just looks so boring. Anyway, it looks boring, Steve. It is boring. Sitting for hours. I just, sorry, I just... Anyway, but I read the description of what they did. It's massive round net. Sorry if I've insulted anybody in their fishing. Go ahead. As long as you're talking to God for the entire time that you're there, go right ahead. Not going, come on, fish, take a bite. Come on, fish, take a bite. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> big round net, uh, about 20 feet apparently in, in diameter or something, with weights on the side of it. They'd wrap it up. Now, some of you that come from other countries might well have seen this, and I've never seen this, okay? But they literally, on one arm, are able to sort of wrap it up and then, no, no, apparently they could, they could pull it in, sort of, they do a weird thing that hold it on one arm. But yes, then with the two, they would then chuck it out over to the sea. It would obviously go out like what I think in my head is like a frisbee, eventually expand, land on the water, I know I'm acting a bit stupid. Some of you are going, no, oh, you've really got this wrong. Yeah, and it goes down into the water. Now, this is the difference. If it was a trawler boat, they hook it up and it will fold up that way and they pull it in. But what used to happen here was, apparently in this time, they would dive into the water, go down and scoop it up from underneath and pull it in. So you know when Peter jumps in the water because when he's the, Jesus is cooking the breakfast at the end of John, the man knows how to swim. So when he's walking on the water towards Jesus and panics, the man knows how to swim. So I just thought you'd like that imagery as a fisherman. Just so you go. So it also means that Peter, as we know, a bit of bluster guts, but none of the disciples were particularly small men, the ones that came from the fishing stock. I mean, to be able to do that, you had to be quite... <sighs> you have to be mescaline a bit, yeah? I just thought you'd like that imagery, save you just sort of having this nice idea of a geezer and his waders out in the lake doing a bit of that. Anyway, I liked it anyway. So then Jesus says to them, calls out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up, the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once and they followed him, leaving their son Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. So what's the first thing that Jesus does to start his ministry in Mark? After being baptised? Starts the church. Yeah, starts a church. Church purely means ecclesia, which means a gathering. We're gathered. That's all it means. So he starts a church, gets his disciples behind him. By the way, have you ever wondered why they just went, yes, Jesus, we'll follow you? Just some random geezer turns up and goes, oi, come follow me. I'll make you a fisher of men. It's because he actually was a rabbi. Dressed as a rabbi, he was a teacher. They understood that he was an educated rabbi. You see that with the woman that was bleeding when she touches the hem of the coke. The Greek in that is actually she touched the tassels. Tassels being Jewish rabbi uh, 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 you know, like me wearing my clerical collar, it's obvious what I do for a living, same thing, but tassels. No, I'm not putting tassels at the end of my shirt. <laughs> but you get the point. So he gets a band of disciples to him. We're not going to dwell on that anymore. Verses 21 to 28. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue and back began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Suddenly, a man in the synagogue, who was possessed by an evil spirit, began shouting, Why, have you, why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus cut him short. Be quiet! Come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. 
The news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. And it's here we're going to dwell a little bit longer. And if it helps you, I've just read verse 28. A synagogue. Firstly, it's Sabbath. It's day of rest, day of teaching. It's the last day. It's, um, it's basically our Sunday. But a synagogue is not the temple at Jerusalem. It's assembly halls or auditoriums where the Torah, the Old Testament effectively, was read and expanded, taught on. Get the point? Like now. No different. There was only actually one synagogue ruler and he basically did a lot of the library keeping, the scribing, and making sure that the building stays stood up. I'm glad to say that gets distributed out in this building to other people like church premises management team. They're keeping the building. You don't think this building stands up by itself, do you? It's got things wrong with it at the moment. At the moment, you'll find if you walk out, please go and actually look at the frames of the windows that actually look a lot whiter and cleaner than normal. That's because Pat, he's going to hate me saying this, but Pat has been coming faithfully every day this week to paint them, even when it rained. So it's on the outside and he's keeping going. Yeah, he's going to hate me saying that and I'll probably get into trouble later, but that's fine. And I'm not saying others don't do other things, that's just the thing I can distinguish because all of a sudden I hear uh, somebody struggling around here and it's, ah, oh, it's Pat's arrived, that's what it is. So anyway, this synagogue ruler, sorry, sideline, synagogue ruler uh, did all this. He never actually did the teaching. Uh, it was done by visiting rabbis, visiting teacher. And here it's Jesus again. It wasn't just some random bloke that just turned up and went, oh, no, I'll just, I'll just teach from the Old Testament. It was, ah, Jesus, recognized rabbi, has been educated, almost has got his master's degree. Do you see the point? We sometimes get this false image that Jesus just turned up. He went through the educational system, followed another Jewish scholar, had to be recognized as a rabbi. So here he is, teaching. Verse 22, and this is the difference though. The people were amazed at his teaching for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. First and foremost, um, this statement is not to be disparaging towards the teachers of religious law. It's so easy to read that and say, oh, they've gone, he's amazing, or oh, they're terrible, they're evil, the, the other teachers. It wasn't that's what we're stating here. All they're purely saying here, what Mark is saying is, look, this Jesus just raised the bar, no end. It's almost sort of the difference between having some sort of international type Christian speaker that everybody thinks is marvellous, um, you know, and me. I don't mean that in a self deprecate I'm trying to find an image. Who can, who can I think of? Who's great evangelist? What's his name? Billy Graham. Imagine that. Billy Graham. Thousands come and just give their lives to Christ after he's just spoken for an hour or whatever else, yeah? So you've got that. That's the sort of imagery. They're trying to raise that, that bar. So it's not being disparaging to the other teachers. It is about saying, this is Jesus. Look at him. Which is Mark is trying to get you to do all the time in the gospel. Look at him. The word authority, the fact he taught with authority, um, is the same Greek word that really means with supernatural powers. Exousia is the... Uh, it's a bad pronunciation by me. It's used mainly of God, actually, in God's work, plus his representatives as expressed through kings, priests, and saints. Who's a saint in this room? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal saviour? If that's you, you're a... 
So you have the same authority in you. The teachers of the law got their authority from the Torah and the tradition of the elders. Jesus gets his directly from the Father in heaven, which is what Mark is trying to show you here. Jesus' authority comes from an immediate and superior authority resident in himself that he received at his baptism. The only reason he has that ultimate authority to preach in the way he was with the authority is because of his baptism. He knew he was the son of God. I mean, you know, a miraculous virgin birth by your mother. You're going to know you're a little bit special, yeah? Having read the, the Old Testament as he would have done, he would have picked up all the Isaiah passages about himself. He would have understood who he was. There's no denying that. But the authority to heal, to cast out, to do all of that, that was done from the point of his baptism when the wild Holy Spirit entered into him. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is that we fall into this trap of thinking that Jesus did all his miracles, all his preaching, did all of it as being the son of God. No, he did not. He did it in the power of God the Holy Spirit. It says in Philippians that he gave up being God. He took on the very nature of a servant. Did not take advantage of his divine powers. So he did not take advantage of him being God to perform everything he did. He did not take advantage of him being God to not sin. He did all of that in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand this. That's why there's no recorded miracles of Jesus prior to that moment, because there were none until he was doing it in the power of those spirit. He could have done it as Jesus, son of God, but he didn't. He re removed that element from him. He gave up the divine right to do that in his div divinity. He did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. I keep emphasizing this because it's going to come to a point in a minute. Do you get what I'm saying? So for some, it's really hard to understand this. Jesus didn't sin, not because he was God, but because he is human, focused on God. Because if he didn't sin because he was God, then you forget the rest of us in this room then. We've had it. He didn't sin because he was human and stayed focused on God. He performed these miracles in the power of the Holy Spirit, not because he was God, but because he was a human filled with the Holy Spirit. And I must use, lose that word, the, because actually Holy Spirit's a person. He's one of the persons of the Godhead. He's not some entity. He's got a personality. So you with me? So if that is true, who's here got the Holy Spirit in them? Who got baptized? Who's accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior? Who has the Holy Spirit in them? Come on. Stick your hands in the air, just like you don't care. Okay? That means that you have the same authority and power as Jesus. Jesus. And there's no like, yeah, but, because that doesn't exist. The same Holy Spirit that dwelt within our Lord Jesus Christ dwells and works through and in you. Significant difference. Jesus knew it, lived it, breathed it, did only what the Father was doing, was open to it all. problem with a lot of us is that we think, oh no, not me. Surely not me. You don't know what I did this morning. Same Holy Spirit. So what's the first miracle that Jesus does? Well, let's reread it again. Suddenly, a man in the synagogue was possessed by an evil spirit, began shouting, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus cut him short. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. And here we have now Mark laying down the opening combat 
between God and the structure of evil in the world. Jesus' first test of authority is almost, forget the authority of teaching, Mark almost seems to want to ignore that almost, but check the proof of my teaching and me with this supremacy I have over the spiritual realm. Notice he doesn't talk about the content of what the teaching was, but he talks about the content of what Jesus did to deal with this evil spirit. So I just want you to imagine that just for a moment. We have nine minutes. Get your imagination hats in. Ready? Teaching here now at the front. Could you just, come on. You're in a gathered place listening to God's word. Oh, you are. Okay. So just imagine it might be Greenford just for a minute. And a man or woman comes running out, beginning shouting. Imagine Jesus is here and he's shouting at Jesus. Notice, by the way, the plural in verse 24. Why are you interfering with us? That means there was more than one resident in this one person, more than one demon. So could you imagine that for a minute? So somebody comes screaming out, why are you interfering with us? We know you're the Holy One of God. Now, most churches, what happened? It'd be like, um, ooh, what do we do with this one? Jesus, no mucking about, cuts the man short in the talk, shouts back at him with a command. There's no embarrassment for Jesus. Jesus doesn't care what the rest of the assembly cares about. He can see that this before him is Satan's minions at work, not the person who's running forward. He doesn't care at all what the congregation thinks. Time to deal with the evil, though on the surface to the unseen spiritual eye, this could be just a troublemaker, yeah? Could you imagine that just for a minute? It could just look like a troublemaker. But Jesus can see something else. There is something wrong here. It could be a gobby person. But Jesus knows it's Satan at work and he doesn't care about the meeting being disturbed. Or the needing to take the man to one side to have a quiet chat and meeting later. Could be almost, can you just come and sit? No, no, let's just sit down. Look, we'll talk to you later, okay? Yeah, if you could just look, just in a minute. Yeah, look, I, I, meet later. After the service, I'll have a chat with you, okay? You'd laugh, but that's what we would do in these churches. Because we wouldn't know. Panic. What are everybody else going to think? Jesus doesn't care. Now is the time to be dealt with here and now, with kingdom authority. The demons know who Jesus is. They know what he's there to do. That's why they name him, by the way. But Jesus has none of it. Could you just imagine that? Jess, quiet and come out of him in the name of Jesus, yeah? Could you imagine that happening here today? Greenfield Baptist Church? Could you imagine it? Oh, see, we don't like this bit. I told you, this is back to basics. I talked about during the worship time that Satan is constantly at work. What causes the physical wars we're having is not men and women. It's Satan having a field day. People make their choices. But underlying it all is evil. Not the person. What's influencing them? Could you imagine that happening here? Could you imagine people are released from demonic spirits being released from oppression? Are we not meant to be good news? Aren't we the church meant to be the people that are releasing the captives? Aren't we meant to be the people who are reclaiming ground and restoring hope? Reclaiming ground, by the way, is not reclaiming a bit of an allotment. It's about reclaiming people's lives that has been stolen from God. Note here that Jesus, he's exercising this person never at the expense of the victim. He's actually doing it to restore them. 
He expels the unclean spirit so that that broken person can be restored to health and wholeness and with a restoration to God. It is not the person who is evil. It is that which is residing in them and they do not know and they need releasing. Jesus, if you will note so far, was preaching and then backs up what he's saying with power. And you're going to see that for the whole of Mark. And you'll see that in Matthew. You see that in, whenever Jesus preached and said something, he just didn't do it and then just walked away. There was power behind it. It will be backed up with miracles. And again, Jesus didn't do it in his own strength. He did it in the power of the Holy Spirit, which we all have residing in us. Jesus here reclaimed this person and restored hope in the person and restored hope in the people watching. Because you can see that by their amazement. Like, By the way, that word amazement is almost like the same word that means they got struck down. They were so shocked by what they just saw. This to me is a strong warrior Jesus. He's named by the demons as the Holy One of God. There's only one other person in the whole of the Bible that actually gets called by that name. Does anybody know who it is? Samson. Samson is called the Holy One of God. He's the only one ever in the whole of the Bible, both old and new, to be called that other than Jesus. Samson. Mr. Couldn't keep it inside his pants if he tried. Had the most fiery temper you'll ever meet in the world. To be real about him. Fell for the wiles of a woman at every turn. I'm sorry, I'd just be real. You know, these people were just like us, imperfect. Don't have to give the secret about your hair. Don't care how attractive she is. Screws up. But still God uses him at the end. Still classes the Holy One of God. And that gets transferred to Jesus to show how authoritative and powerful Jesus is. And clearly, much, much more perfect than Samson. So the first miracle that is in here, the first moment of Jesus beyond calling a church, oh, hello, church, is to perform a miracle of reclaiming ground and restoring hope by casting out Satan's minions, about allowing that release in the Holy Spirit to occur. And that power resides in... Correct. Thank you, Dorothy. That authoritative power, through the power of God the Holy Spirit, resides in... I once had a discussion many years ago. Um, I'm not going to go into with who. That would be unfair. But I was having a discussion with someone. And we were talking about, is Satan at work in Britain? Are there possessed people? Satanic oppression, that sort of stuff. And I said, well, we don't hear of it much in, in, in the UK. Don't hear of it much in Greenford. Don't quite see it happening a lot, do you? And I said, then they're f and they said, so not really at work here. And I said, that's probably wrong. The fact we don't see it probably means we've been blinded considerably more. It means he's probably working at it a lot harder. We're in a battle, my brothers and sisters. When you accepted Jesus, your Lord and Savior, you entered into the army and you said, yes. One more powerful resides in you than would ever, ever reside with Satan. Holy Spirit. So you shouldn't be scared. That's the point. But could you imagine that happening here in Greenford? People who have got that. And you don't, it's not always obvious. You need spiritual eyes open to see. And I'm not looking for Satan under every rock and turn and not every illness. Is it satanic? All right, hear me carefully. But don't be blinded to the fact that coast along and it's not there. There is always a spiritual battle going on. There's a spiritual battle going on on church on a Sunday morning. There's a spiritual battle going on when you're at home relaxing on your sofa watching Grand Designs or EastEnders. 
What I'm saying is, be open to the idea that when it's back to basics, let's not forget this bit of the authority. And then we are going to next week look at healing. I mean, there's a moment where Jesus raises somebody from the dead. I want to try and just get us slightly excited about the fact that the Holy Spirit lives in us. And there's that authoritative power. So I have a last question. If this church should be known for reclaiming for Christ and restoring hope, it could well involve, and I believe it would involve that, question is, do you want it? Do you want it for the person who needs to know Jesus? Not for yourself. It's for the person who needs to be reclaimed. For the person who needs that hope in their lives. Holy Spirit living in you isn't for your personal comfort. I'll come back to what Edward said at the end. When he very simply put it like this discipleship, sorry, the gospel. The gospel is proclaimed and known in adversity and suffering, not in ease and comfort. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, I want to give you, actually, Lord, we give you thanks because we don't need to stand alone. We give you thanks that you have provided all that is required to spread your gospel, your good news. Each of us in this room is a testament to that moment. And Lord, I want to pray for us that we do go back to the stage, Lord, or back to some basics of recognising, Lord, that it's not about us, but it's about you and those out there that don't know you. I want to pray right now for an an extra increase of your spirit upon everybody here. Everybody's got it, Lord. I just pray that we acknowledge it. We acknowledge that authoritative, authoritative that we have in us. Lord, as we walk out of here, Help us to reclaim ground and restore hope in your power. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv. 